Okay, guys. Uh, yeah, so what I'm going to present today is something I'm very passionate about, which is Australian hardwoods. I've basically spent my whole working life, um, nearly 40 years, uh, working uh, either in research and development or uh, manufacturing or growing or sales and distribution or marketing on Australian hardwoods and something, like I said, I'm passionate about. And today I just want to really uh, talk about how we can get the best out of this amazing product. Right, so um, I believe that Australian hardwoods or, or timber in particular is really the, uh, the building material of the 21st century. Never before has there been such a high demand from a design and construct or environmental point of view. There are many amazing properties of Australian hardwoods that make it the ideal choice uh, in design uh, in commercial and domestic constructions. A number of these properties are presented here and I'll just briefly touch on, on each of them. Um, but, you know, durability, uh, you know, basically the natural durability uh, rating is, is how durable the hardwood of the, of, of the timber is. And generally for external use, we look at what we call class one or class two durability. And that's its ability to resist uh, uh, wood decay and wood destroying insects. So the other important, uh, another important um, aspect of uh, Australian hardwoods is versatility. And that is basically, it can be used in a variety of applications uh, that are very, uh, you know, very hard on any building material, you know, bridges, uh, decks, uh, you know, cladding on buildings, you know, areas where you, normal building products suffer from a lot of degrade due to uh, weathering and due to uh, foot traffic and so on. Um, Australian hardwoods are very dense, especially durable Australian hardwoods. Generally, a class one or two timber has a density of between 700 and 1,000 kilograms per cubic metre. Um, this also allows them to span further and are less resistant to impact damage. A really is an amazing thing about Australian hardwoods, too durable Australian hardwoods, is it's probably the only uh, building product that I know of that actually increases in value as it ages. Um, you know, as I say there, that you know Australian hardwoods, uh, tomorrow's recycled timber, and it, over 20, 30, 40 years, good durable hardwood actually doubles in its value. Um, other, other building materials can be recycled, but, but durable Australian hardwoods actually increase in value as they age. Um, health and well-being, basically durable Australian hardwoods, once again, we're in an organic society, you know, basically anything natural, uh, chemical free is in at the moment and as durable Australian hardwoods meet all that criteria. Yeah, you know, there's been a lot of reported studies showing the health benefits, uh, you know, both uh, mentally uh, and also in air quality and just the general uh, <coughs> warmth and comfort of natural timber in the, in the built environment is a really big plus. Sustainability, you know, Australian hardwoods basically, once again, are one of the only truly sustainable building products, not just Australian hardwoods, hardwoods generally, or timber generally, is one of the most sustainable building products. It's recyclable, it stores carbon. Um, you know, the trees that grow that we produce it from, you know, suck out uh, uh, greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. It, uh, it, it ticks all the environmental boxes. Um, and, you know, what we will talk a bit later about is that we want to make sure that any timber and any, you know, any hardwoods that are used are, are sourced uh, responsibly. Right, so we're gonna talk about where Australian hardwoods, you know, what are their, their, the key areas in construction they're used in? And con the construction they're used in is generally both domestic and commercial. Um, and these four categories probably meet the, the, the most popular areas that they, uh, they are used. Um, generally, any of these four areas, they will um, be a class one or class two durability, as I said before. Uh, they're exposed to the weather and the environment. And in these applications, the timber can last, uh, you know, more than 
25 years. Generally, a class one, uh, one or two timber above ground will last 20 years plus. Uh, and if maintained properly, you know, as we've seen from history, uh, you know, there's timber houses still 100 years old. So it's a very, very, you know, as long as it's maintained and specified and used in the right application, it can last a, a long, long time. So with, with, with cladding, you know, external cladding, um, you know, one of the most popular uh, profiles and something that we, uh, you know, most of our uh, sales are, are based on is a shiplap cladding. And it, it comes, a shiplap cladding basically comes in a, a range of different widths and profiles um, and, and finishes, you know, some are dressed, some are rough, uh, rough sawn. Uh, but as you can see here, anything from a, a 38 mil cover right up to a 110 mil cover, it can be V-joint, it can be tongue and grooved, it can be secret fixed. Uh, and, and then when it goes onto the, uh, the facade of a building, you can actually uh, finish it in uh, you know, a, a paint or a stain or a, a natural finish to get some amazing, uh, amazing results. Uh, another uh, cladding material is that's quite popular is board and batten, batten cladding. Basically, board and batten cladding uh, is uh, a baseboard that is is laid laid generally on uh, uh, fixing battens, uh, and then a catboard that goes over the uh, the joint between the two baseboards. This tends to give you a much uh, more three D effect on the on the cladding, you know, a more profiled look. Uh, and once again, there's some amazing uh, designs and, and, and builds where this really is highlighted in the architecture of the building. Uh, another uh, cladding material, once again, you know, a cladding profile is weatherboards and they can be straight edge or natural edge. You know, what, what I'll just show you here is, is I'll, I'll speed this up a little bit, but this is a, a natural edge weatherboard and generally, um, actually, I'll go past that. Sorry, that's not playing for some reason, which it should be. But anyway, go past that. Okay. Um, screen boards. Now, screen boards are used for a number of different reasons. You know, they can be used uh, architecturally, they can be used as privacy screens. They can be used as uh, as um, uh, you know uh, in a number of amazing locations. You know where where basically the the like this bottom right hand corner. You know the the screens can flow from inside to outside. Uh, they're a very versatile product and and been used more in construction uh, all the time. Um, climate control is another area as well. Okay, um, decking is another area for, uh, you know, for use of um, hardwood timber externally. You know, basically, uh, you know, hardwood decking is an ideal choice because of its density and for its hardness and its ability to span, uh, you know, uh, span longer distances. And, you know, once again, you know, decking comes in different widths from you know, 70 mil right through to 140 mil and thicknesses of anything from 20 to 32 mil. Um, you know, basically it is the ideal uh, choice for, uh, you know, for catering for the harsh Australian environment, you know, because of its, its density and its durability properties. You know, uh, decking in landscaping is very popular, and you know it can tie in a uh, you know a, you know a, a, a commercial or uh, you know commercial or residential property that's on a slope. You know, it's, it's the ideal uh, choice of construction for making outdoor areas on on slopey ground. The fourth area is architectural because of the versatility of of, of hardwood. You know, it can be used in a range of shapes and sizes and uh, and really adds to the uh, architectural um, integrity of a building and also the uh, you know the design um, uh, appearance of a building you know it's it's something that can be 
generally manufactured and built on site and to a specific design, whereas you know, most other building products uh, are nowhere near as versatile as that. You know, they have to be done in a workshop somewhere still. It has to be you know, bent over, over rollers and so on. Um, architectural wedges in, you know, once again, in commercial construction, you know, they can really enhance and soften other building materials like, uh, like tin and stone and, and, and masonry and create, create, you know, some amazing architectural features. So what, what we really need to do is we need to look at choosing the right wood for your next project and what property should be considered. I want to sort of go over a, a range of things because to actually, you know, while Australian hardwoods are a fantastic choice for you know, all these external applications, we want to make sure they're incorporated and specified and designed right because the more you can do up front, the better the performance and the better the durability and the better the overall result. So we've got to look at what, uh, you know, what key factors we should be looking at. One of, one of the key things is, you know, I mentioned before is durability. Uh, you know, durability, you know, we have to have a minimum of class one or class two, uh, you know, durable timber if it's going to be used outside. Um, you can't really use just mixed species hardwoods because you don't know that, you know, it's a range, it's a a bag of, uh, of durability's um, uh, mix of species, and therefore you could have anything from a one to four. So, so generally when you're specifying an outdoor project, uh, you must specify that, especially you know, if it's gonna be used above ground, outside exposed, that it's a durability one or two. And, and with these durabilities, you know, basically, you know, how timber is classified is it's, it's a four, a four level uh, classification. You know, one is highly durable, four is non-durable. So you, you can sort of see here, and there's also above ground durability and in ground contact durability. So, you know, you know class one durability are our iron barks, our spotted guns, our black butts, which above ground give 40 plus years. Uh, in ground it's 25 plus years. And that goes right down to, if you look at the class fours or the non-durable species, things like Maranti, Radiata Pine and Oregon, you're down to seven years above ground and less than five years in ground. So you can see that this, you know, class one and class two, which is the highly durability, uh, durable and the durable, you're looking at 40 plus years for these species. And this is really what we, we recommend for, you know, our, our cladding screen boards and decking. Another thing that's very important to uh, you know to look at is the bowl you know the bowl rating of the construction uh, and there's certain timbers that can be used and uh, approved uh, in in the different bowl ratings. So all all locations you know whether it's commercial or residential construction get a bowl rating from basically you know uh, you know from low in metropolitan Melbourne uh, right through to flame zone, which is basically in the middle of a forest. Uh, the most common uh, in in residential construction is around this Bell 19, Bell 29. Um, uh, you know that's that's in in especially in rural. Obviously, Metro Melbourne will be you know up up this end. So what this shows is there's certain timbers that they call bushfire resistant timbers, and they're the more durable and and more dense timbers like ironback, uh, ironbark, black butt. Uh, you know, silver top spotted gum, they can be used in these Bell 29 uh, areas in decking, cladding and screen boards and other applications. So, you know, basically, if you are in a Bell 29 uh, area, you must, you know, you must specify bushfire resistant timbers and, you know, that's, you know, that will be approved by any building surveyor. Uh, and, you know, once again, it's, uh, uh, you know, really important. So, so these specifications should be you know, put into uh, any documentation or planning, uh, you know, uh, or, or working drawing, so that there's no mistakes made. Um, choosing the correct uh, structural grade. You know, once again, um, you know, the, you know, if it's going to be used, if the timber is going to be used in a in a structural application, we must make sure that 
that is clearly identified and uh, that, it, that it is also marked in any working drawings. Um, as I said before, design for durability is uh, an important thing. You know, the design of durable external structures begins with understanding how weathering and, and moisture and UV interacts with building materials. Um, generally, I, I like throwing this, this photo in on the left hand side because it, it shows you, you know, a, it's, it's, not, it's not Australian hardwood, but it's, it's composite you know, plastic timber that was put in, in a very harsh environment in a lysosome club on the um, on the on the bay, uh, and it just didn't perform. It shouldn't it shouldn't have been put in that application. Uh, there was a lot of um, you know movement and and degrade UV degrade. So we must make sure that the, the you know when we're using the product, it's put in the right application to and how it's going to be exposed to the weather, the UV and the rain is taken into account. So. As I was saying, importance of detailed drawings and specifications. You know, these are critical, you know, because, you know, this is what follows the build right through. And the more information that people put on drawings and specifications, the better. Uh, you know, on, on the plans, noting manufacturer's recommendations, or at least a reference to the manufacturer's uh, recommendations is extremely important. Um, and also, you know, planning in the design and, and this is something that architects in particular got to take notice of, that you really need to plan and be aware of you know, where the worst of weather comes from in any, any design. Generally, you know, north and northwest facing exposed conditions in Australia, you know, cop sun and cop rain and are very harsh for, for weather, you know, decking or cladding or anything else. Whereas, you know, easterly and southerly locations uh, quite often get very little you know, UV exposure, they might get a, a, a bit of moisture, but but the, it's chalk and cheese, the difference between the weathering patterns on the, on those two areas. You can see here, you know, this this here on the left-hand side, fully exposed northwest orientation, you get, you know, a driftwood gray, you know, uniform look. The same timber around the same time on a east or south wall, uh, the timber is hardly weathered, you know, and maintains its color. So you've got to take this you know, when you're when you're designing a building, you've got to take this into uh, you know you know into the design process and say, well, maybe you know, depending on what sort of look the customer or or the client wants, um, you know, they might want this weathered look, but you've got to you know what comes with that on the other side of the building, you're going to get this other look. So so being aware of that can actually make your design and and your performance of your design work a lot better. Um, you know, design it against the risk. Once again, you know, in a, in a building, there's key, key areas and, and the, the, the enemy of any building is moisture. You know, it, it's, you know, there's key areas on any building where, where you'll get potential for a moisture ingress or moisture collection. And what moisture does, if you get moisture, you've got the potential for decay. And decay is, you know, the biggest enemy of, of timber used externally. Um, Things like uh, you know proper flashings over windows, uh, you know both on the uh, uh, on the head and 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 the sill and the sides, uh, handrails, pergolas, balustrades, uh, decks, uh, you know decks, you know uh, that uh, oh, especially decks over the top of rooms. Uh, there's a number of areas that if, if you're aware of where moisture can collect and and you've got timber in those locations, it's you've got to actually make sure you can design against it. You know, and that includes designing against moisture traps. Moisture traps, you know, basically, uh, you know, anywhere where, where moisture, you know, here you've got shiplap, you've got grooves on the weather side of a house, you can see that these grooves just track water down and then you've got a flashing between the, uh, the two lots of uh, shiplap here. So water will sit on, on that flashing and you know that ingrain there is um, is not sealed, uh, or it, or the, t the water can't get away. Slowly, you'll get mould developing, and the potential for decay to come. Uh, you know, if the timber's kept wet over long periods of time. So you know, avoiding moisture traps, allowing you know good flashings, allowing good drainage, allowing good airflow are all very important things. Uh, you know, sealants. Uh, you know, sealants. Um, uh, you know. 
not having an, another issue we quite often see is insufficient construction tolerances. So if timber is tied up against other timber or timber is tied up against a, um, a, a flashing, uh, you know, the timber swells and shrinks and you can get capillary action and you can get the you know, water trap there. So, so allowing good tolerances to allow timber, uh, water to drain away is very important. So as I said, you know, basically we to, to uh, improve the performance of Australian hardwoods outside, it's important that we put as much information and, and, uh, and technical information into the drawings. You know, basically looking at, um, you know, looking at specifying products with the proper uh, description, looking at in, you know, how they're going to be installed, you know, looking at, you know, drawings to show, you know, flashing design, to show uh, batten design, to show, you know, fixing batten design, to, to show, uh, you know, exactly how that timber is going to be installed so it doesn't leave anything up to guesswork. If there's a number of trades that come in uh, over, to, over, you know, over, the, over a build, and the more detail that's there, you know, for the carpenters, for the roofers, for the, uh, you know, the, the window installers, uh, the better the result of the, the, the design, but also the performance of that design. So what we're trying to do is maximise the durability of our timber when it's installed. And so, you know, it's important that that documentation is put in, in great detail into our technical info and drawings. Um, you know, things like, uh, you know, things like fasteners are very important, you know, specifying the correct fasteners, uh, you know, often, you know, they're the, the glue holding, you know, holding the construction materials together, you know, generally screws are better than, than nails, generally stainless is better than, than coated, so, so depending on the, on, on the level of exposure, you want to go for your, your the best service performance of fasteners and not scrimp on them. Um, you can sort of see here, you know, uh, you know, sometimes coated nails, they can be damaged during the installation process. Uh, same with coated screws uh, and you can get, uh, you can get metal staining uh, or, or here, you know, nails popping out. So it's very important that we get our fasteners right and that they're specified on the plans once again. Um, understanding how timber actually behaves in surface, you know, in the design phase is really important. Most timber does leach, you know, some worse than others, but once you understand that it doesn't leach its whole service life, you know, probably in the first three to six months. So, you know, allowing that, that weathering process to happen, and obviously it's gonna happen more in winter than summer, uh, and, you know, ex extractants or tannins will bleed out. Uh, so some sort of protection on adjoining surfaces should be provided, or at least, uh, know that there's going to have to be some cleanup at the end of a, a six month period once that tannins has bled out of the timber. Uh, but knowing about it and knowing what's going to happen is better than having a client come back and say, look, I've, uh, you, you know, you destroyed my terrazzo under, underneath my timber deck. Um, you know, it's a really important to, to be aware of what can happen and then take uh, the necessary action to prevent it or, or to remediate it. Once again, uh, you know, met metal contamination. You know, a lot of times we, over the years, we've been rang up and, and said, look, you know, I've got mold growing all over my timber. It's just been installed. Uh, nine times out of 10, it's, it's metal contamination. Any metal filings from grinding or drilling or, or roofing, any, any sort of processing in a build around raw timber, uh, and then you get some dew, dew or rain will cause metal contamination, which is this bluish black uh, staining on timber, um, which looks really unsightly on brand new timber. Um, but knowing that that will occur, you know, by covering any of your exposed timber, and making sure those operations aren't uh, done in the vicinity. Uh, and then if, if all else fails, it can be cleaned off with a, um, a wood cleaner like oxalic acid will clean, it, uh, clean the surface and take it back to the original color of the timber. But um, but it's better to be aware of these things, you know, during the design and construct uh, stage. So now I'll touch on on the the different uh, the, the different product profiles and and using best practice. Uh
uh, in design and construction. Basically, shiplap cladding uh, can be used in any, any class one building. Uh, you know, it, um, uh, obviously there are some species uh, required in certain bell ratings, but as an overall thing, you know, class one buildings or houses can use timber, timber cladding, especially up to a bell 29. Um, best practice, you know, once again with cladding, just be aware of how weather interacts with it um, and th things like splash zones. You know, if timber is coming down to a, uh, you know, to a, um, a, another surface where rain will hit and splash on, onto the timber, you're going to get some uh, variation in, in staining and even potentially mould from those areas where uh, the timber is kept fairly constantly wet. Um, you know, this, this will have a colour change, but it'll also, you know, some people will, be, you, know, uh, you know, will not be happy with the fact that they're getting on their new build, they're getting this type of staining. So, you know, it can, it, it, as long as you know it's going to occur, it's either, uh, you know, this timber would need to be uh, sealed in some way or would need to be, you know, painted or stained, or you might not, not use it in an instance where there is a splash zone. You might actually raise, you know, raise it and have another material there, just knowing that that's going to have, uh, you know, be an effect of, of, of weathering. Um, with cladding, you know, one of the key, key areas to look at is, you know, we've got here 50 shades of grey. Um, what does that mean? Well, basically it means that, uh, you know, grey in timber can look very unsightly when it's not consistent. And why it's not consistent is that, you know, a house is not in one plane. You know, it's, it's facing, generally most houses that I know are facing north, south, east and west. Uh, so. So you're going to get, you know, as I said before, on a north or northwest face, you're going to get, you know, extreme exposure. So that timber is going to grey off or lose its colour and and and, and go grey quite quickly. Other areas under the parapets, under eaves, uh, you know, on the east side are not going to be uh, anywhere near exposed. Probably the the worst back with weather, weathering or, or like I said, fifty shades of grey is where you've got the one. Uh, the one face of a building and you've got variations of colour within that face. And that can be because, you know, it could be a deck that's half under cover and half out. It could be a, um, uh, you know, cladding that has got a wide eave at the top and, and exposed at the bottom. So, so it's really, you know, typical of this one here. You've got the, the overhang here. Uh, the timber uh, there is quite clean looking, uh, quite unweathered, and then down here exposes. So that looks messy it doesn't look that pleasant um, so as long as you know that happens in your design you, you might actually say well maybe on that 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 side we're not going to have an overhang or maybe we're not going to even use timber on that side or maybe we're going to make sure that timber's coated you know coated because you know it's not going to look nice after five years so knowing how timber behaves can actually as i said you know keep harping back on it you can make sure that you get the best you know you, the best design to make sure that you know five years, ten years, twenty years down the track, the timber, the, the house, or the construction is going to look uh, as good as it did when it was first installed. You know, um, fully exposed, you know, you know, like this place here, facing north, northwest, fully exposed, no overhangs. You know, timber looks fantastic. You know, it's driftwood grey, it's uniform. That that particular building. Has got no treatment on at all and wouldn't never need maintenance. So, so you can sort of see, you know, while uh, you know, um, if you know how weather is going to behave, you can actually make the ongoing maintenance of a building a lot less. Uh, and you know, this here, if this was was painted or stained, you'd have to set up scaffolding. It'd be quite a ongoing cost on a regular basis. So, so understanding that weathering pattern. And, and how it will behave over a period of time in your design is very important. Um, cladding, uh, you know, cladding practices and flashing detail. You know, as I said before, the most important thing is to keep out moisture. So head flashings, side flashings, uh, sill flashings, yeah, in, uh, in coating any, uh, any cut boards to make sure that they're sealed and that uh, they're going to help repel moisture. Um, will make sure 
that you know that uh, that the moisture is not going to get behind the cladding and that the integrity of it is going to um, be maintained. And what's important there is once again, in your drawings, you know, to make sure that it's there's clear detail of how the said flashing is done, you know, where your fixing battens go, where your cladding goes, uh, you know, what sort of tolerances you allow between the cladding and, uh, you know, any, any flashing to allow water to drain off. All these things give you the opportunity to to let the uh, the builder or or the installer know best practice. And once they know best practice and they're not they're leaving it to guesswork, the result will be a lot better. Cladding once again, sarking is very important. You know, using a a, a, a vapor permeable sarking, it will allow the um, uh, the the cavity behind the cladding to breathe. Uh, and you will um, also allow any moisture that might get into that cavity to, to escape. So this is very important. You know, generally we recommend, you know, uh, basically to have sarking, fixing battens uh, and uh, airspace, uh, you know, ventilation behind the, um, uh, the, the cladding for uh, any moisture that might, you know, seep through. Because these claddings aren't 100% watertight. So, you know, good ventilation behind the cladding actually allows any moisture to, to, to dry out and not cause any issues. You can see here, th this is a typical uh, installation of a, you know, of a of cladding where we've got, you know, a fixing batten. We've got a drip edge here, 15 degrees at the bottom of the cladding to allow, you know, any, any water that comes uh, down these grooves or on the face of this cladding to drip off. So you've got your fixing battens. Uh, if, if, you know, we can have, have a packer behind there with this uh, vented cavity closure, which goes on the bottom. And this allows, uh, you know, it allows vermin not to get out into the cavity, but allows uh, air movement to get behind this cladding. Uh, and you've got your breathable sarking here. So this is, a you know, what, what we recommend as, a, as the ideal uh, fixing strategy for any cladding. Uh, and we've been doing this for over 20 years without any uh, performance issues. Uh, I'll go on best practices for screening. Um, doesn't look right there, but anyway. Um, basically, uh, screenings, as I said earlier, can be used for uh, they can be used for privacy. They can be used for climate control. They can even be used for uh, as battens over blue border as a cladding. Um, so, so in this particular area, they um, there is a waterproof blue board that's been you know, waterproofed underneath these battens and these battens are simply a, a, you know, a, a, a cladding feature over that blue board. Um, best practices once again is you know fixing spacings. spacings. Basically you know, hardwood battens are, or screen boards are, are great because they have, uh, they have the ability to span you know, six, eight hundred, even up to a metre without deflection. Um, and you know that, so, so basically we want to make sure that the spacings of the battens behind are once again specified on the plan. So it's not leaving it to guesswork, but the, you, know, uh, you know, go to the manufacturer's recommendations and make sure that's put onto the plan so that the, 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 the spacings of the battens that go to fix the screen boards is specified. You know, gaps, you know, once again, specify gaps depending on whether, uh, you know, uh, the gaps between screens, whether it's for privacy or whether it's for uh, screening, you know, it, it, various uh, gapping can be allowed, uh, and this uh, gapping can also obviously allow the the screen boards to to um, uh, to swell and contract without uh, interfering on the adjacent one. Uh, best practice in decking uh, design and construction. Um, there's some key things here to look at and and to also put on plans and 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 working drawings. You know, this one here, you know, you've got dissimilar materials. You've got a gutter here, uh, you know, going straight onto a deck. You know, this gutter can collect water. So water on the shoes, you know, from one, one, one material to another material uh, is, you know, it's fraught with danger as far as a slip hazard. You know, direction of boards, you know, basically you really want, uh, you know, the direction of travel to have your boards going horizontal to the direction of travel. 
you know, if you're going uh, in the same direction of travel, uh, it, it, it doesn't give you much traction. So, so generally we would look at, you know, you're going at right angles to your, your, your travel direction. You know, um, installation of uh, uh, slip resistant fixtures, uh, you know, tape metal strips on stairs or any areas that are you know, suspected that they might be slip hazards, you know, that's important. And, and the, the fourth thing that can be considered is uh, on decking is a rough sawn finish. And so instead of a smooth dressed um, fine finish, a rough sawn finish uh, you know, gives you a bit more traction. So planning for these, depending on, on potentially, uh, you know, where the deck's gonna be located, you know, is it gonna be not get much sun on it? Is it on the south side of a house, you know, it potentially can get, you know, mold growing on it. It's important that these things are taken into consideration. Ventilation in decks, you know, this is really important. A lot, a lot of people know about ventilation in flooring in houses, but decks are no different. Decks are still timber and you need good ventilation under the decks to make sure that moisture doesn't collect, number one, under a, a low lying deck, but also, uh, you know, um, what, what you'll get here is if you've got moisture collecting under the deck or a low lying deck with poor ventilation uh, the environment under the deck is different to the uh, uh, to the top surface of the deck and generally you'll get boards swelling and and they can start cupping as well they can be start putting an amazing pressure against each other uh, and causing issues so so raised decks should have good ventilation uh, and, and basically good drainage you know they're very very important when designing a deck and I've seen lots and lots of decks and, and drainage under decks and ventilation often isn't taken into consideration, but it is very important. Um, decking, once again, best practice, it's good to specify, you know, what sort of finish, you know, what sort of finish, you know, and it probably goes for cladding as well. But with that, it's very important to look at the, the orientation of the deck or the cladding, you know, where, you know, as I said before, is it on the east side or is it on the north side? Once you know that, you'll know, you have a lot more uh, idea of how it's going to perform and what you should be specifying. You know, generally, you know, for deck finishes, there's um, there's coatings and there's, uh, there's oil based. Uh, you know, generally any coatings, uh, all finishes are going to require maintenance uh, and it depends on ease of maintenance and how much exposure it gets. The, the more exposure, uh, the less likely you're going to use a film forming finish because it's going to peel and crack and you're going to have major maintenance problems. Generally, uh, very high exposure areas, you know, you'd be a lot better off either doing nothing and letting the timber go grey or uh, having um, uh, an all based sealer or or, or based deck finish and managing customer expectations. This is very important. You know, there is no deck finish or timber finish outside that will last 10 years. You know, it's gonna, they're all gonna require maintenance. So you need to, to have your know, plan for that and make sure that customers and clients are aware of that. Trends in design and construction. Um, basically, I'll just go through some key areas now that we have noticed just over the last 10 years uh, of where there has been a real boom in external timber use in construction in Australia. Uh, you know, this is very common where you get a, a renovated ordinary home, uh, you know, it might be a spec home and people put a, a modern timber extension on it. It really gives the whole thing a lift. Uh, this can happen in the suburbs, it can happen in inner city, lots of period places in you know, inner city where you know, they, they believe it the period facade and do an amazing thing. Um, Cural Tim has been used more and more in landscaping as well. You know, it's beautiful, it's organic, it is chemical free. You know, it's got all those you know, amazing properties that, that you know, designers are looking for. And you know, like I said, it's exploding in landscaping, especially children's playgrounds as well. Uh, yeah. Having a bit of a problem hearing your audio, you might need to come close to the microphone. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so landscaping um, and playground design, uh, you know, is 
as I said, you know, there's amazing architects out there and landscape architects out there and playground architects out there that are doing some, you know, amazing designs with with durable Australian hardwoods. Another another trend that you know that we've seen is you know is as I said, you know, timber being organic is curved walls and 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 curved structures. You know, timber, as I said before, is very versatile. Uh, it can be used to create you know amazing organic shapes. And, and this is uh, something in design that is uh, really exciting. You know, uh, like I said, in, in you know, curved walls, you, know, you can see in this bottom screen here, um, you know, timber you know, shiplap can be easily conformed to a, to a, a curve. And you know, there's some amazing shapes and uh, construction designs that have been built over the last 10 years. And, and as I said, this is really growing in, in design. Uh, another trend uh, that we are heavily involved with ourselves, but uh, is happening throughout the industry is pre-coating before the timber arrives on site. And what this does is, um, you know, it, it allows the timber to be protected before it even goes up on the wall. So, you know, quite often, you know, construction's gone for a period of time, the product gets delivered, it gets left outside in the rain, the weather, the mud, you know, and as I said, weathering, you know, before the timber is up can cause issues, you know, the timber can change in, in uh, dimensions, you know, it's very important that that timber is protected while on site before it's installed. So this pre-coating, uh, you know, basically, uh, you know, protects the timber before before it gets installed and is really popular and, and saves the builder from having to uh, get another trade in as well. And, uh, another trend is, uh, you know, is putting a rustic finish. You know, we uh, have seen, you know, this organic weathered finish, uh, which can be put onto timber beforehand, uh, is almost maintenance free because, you know, it, it naturally uh, looks weathered when it comes and it, it gets installed from you and as it slowly weathers off itself uh, and goes back to the natural weathering pattern you get a much more uniform approach so so instead of having these up under eave areas where they normally wouldn't get any weather and and be looking pristine timber color the whole structure regardless whether it's got eaves or overhangs or anything is a lot more uniform Timber wedges, you know, this is something that we do a lot of, you know, whether they're in screen boards or, or you know, uh, architectural or other areas, just using different shapes and sizes of timber. You know, this works with the way we cut our timber, but, uh, you, know, it, 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 you know, we produce these products and architects take them and, and use them in amazing ways that sort of adds to, uh, you know, uh, design development. In matching and engineered timber, you know, generally you know, in matching has been around for a long time, but this is a really good thing for using up shorts and, and for maximizing recovery from, from you know, what is a valuable expensive material. Durable hardwoods, uh, you know, they are a, a top quality uh, and fairly highly priced uh, product. So this allows to maximize the, uh, the recovery from any production process. You know, generally in the old days, you know, finger joint used to be, you know, in the face, which looked a bit ordinary. You know, nowadays, uh, you know, it's much more like an in matching type process where, where for cladding, it, you know, you see it, it's very hard to pick quite often in the, you know, in the board. Screen systems. Um, these are becoming very popular. A number of companies actually promote and, and market them. Uh, you know, they're, they're basically a, you know, a clip-in system uh, that's, uh, you know, nailless and screwless. Uh, you know, these can be used to produce, you know, once again, amazing shapes and designs and uh, a lot more of these, you know, screen board type clip lock systems are uh, being developed and been used uh, mainly in commercial construction, but, you know, uh, you know, a lot of those things will spin off into domestic construction as well. Screen boards in house design, you can sort of see here, you know, architects once again, uh, you know, not just, 
doing it, uh, you know, in, in one plane. It'll be, you know, in a number of different, you know, walls, uh, you know, to either block off light, let light in, you know, it can be used in an, a lot of uh, very interesting design elements. And, you know, screen boards have probably been one of the biggest growth areas that, that we've seen in, uh, you know, in the hardwood industry. Uh, the, the trend, a trend of timber flowing seamlessly from inside to outside, you know, the old fresco area, you know, whereby, you know, you've got your outdoor patio, you, you, you open up your, uh, your, your sliding doors and the inside floats seamlessly into the outside. You know, this is definitely a trend, you know, and having, you know, the timber inside your house and outside and having it matching uh, is, uh, you know, really popular. We have seen more demand from you know, designers and architects for you know, plantation or certified timber. Um, you know, native forest takes, you know, generally takes 60 to 80 years to produce a saw log. A properly managed plantation can produce a suitable saw log in half this time. So, so plantations are important, um, but you know, probably what's more important is where is the supply of our Australian hub was going to come from in the future? You know, that is really important. You know, we've got, you know, no one disputes we've got climate change, we've got more severe bushfires. You know, where, you know, this does have an effect on supply and where can we um, get a sustainable source resource of Australian hardwoods from, from now and into the future? So. It's a, a very, very important question. You know, we shouldn't be relying on, you know, overseas durable timber. You know, there's lots of durable timber from overseas, from um, especially from third world countries, you know, from tropical rainforest. But, you know, we really should be not saying, well, hang on, we're going to not manage our own timber sustainably, but we'll just get it from the third world. And, you know, we should be thinking, uh, thinking globally and acting, acting locally. This is a really important point, um, you know, and we sort of probably owe it to not just be small minded when it comes to that and look at you know, how we can best manage our own native forest resource. You know, generally, um, I'll talk, I know, I know a lot about Victoria, so I'll generally talk about Victoria. You know, in Victoria, we you know, currently harvest one tree in, in 10,000. Each, you know, basically of, of every 10,000 trees, we're harvesting one, one tree uh, of our native forest. And every tree that we harvest or that is harvested is regrown, regrown without any net loss of trees. Even fire affected trees and forests grow back quickly. You know, within 10 years, unless there's been a very severe fire, you'd go into a, a burnt forest and it would look quite natural. So, so the sustainable management of our existing native forest is an important, uh, uh, it's a really important resource we've got to try and continue to manage and, and develop. Uh, and basically in Victoria, we have um, over the last 30 years, and not many people would know this fact, but over the last 30 years, the actual forest area in Victoria has actually grown. So we've got something like 150,000 hectares more forests now than we had 30 years ago. And, uh, you know, that's mainly due to plantation establishment. Um, we still need to look at establishing more high value durable plantations. And, you know, we have been doing that for 15 plus years. Um, you know, we plant three main species in Victoria. Uh, it's important that this durable, these durable high value plantations are used to supplement the native regrowth forests that we have and that we continue to source sustainably. So basically, you know, this helps insulate us from any uh, fire or environmental effects. You know, they, the two go hand in hand. It's not one or the other. You know, we, um, we need to have both. This here is, you know, basically, as I said, we've, we've, we've planted a thousand hectares over the last 15 years and you know, we've got about another thousand uh, hectares to plant over the next five years, you know, and we, we do plan on, on trying to be as, as self-sufficient in plantation uh, durable hardwoods as we can, but, you know, the industry overall needs as much of this resource 
that is sourced sustainably as we can get. I'm just going to finish up now on uh, some inspiration and just to really show you, uh, you know, some builds, you know, built with, 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 you know, cladding and decking and, and, and architectural builds. And it just shows you the versatility, uh, the, you know, and some amazing design elements that, uh, you know, that um, make a durable Australian hardwoods a, a really important choice in any construction. You know, you know th this particular one here is you know a modern uh, a modern extension to a period home in Fitzroy or somewhere. So you know it's 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 a you, know, you wouldn't think you're in the middle of you know four k's from the CVD. Um, you know, and once again, durable Australian hardwoods can be used in near the coast. They can be used in the mountains, in the snow. You know, it's very versatile product regardless of the environmental conditions. You know, some interesting designs here, you know, timber, you know, it's not just a timber house with a timber deck, you know, by adding screen boards and other timber elements and other design elements, you get a very, very modern feel. Once again, screen board, you know, really, you know, really interesting designs. This is one down near the coast as well. Uh, yeah, this one here is a um, com oh, this one here is a commercial construction. Um, you know, so like I said, it's not just domestic; it's domestic and commercial. And really, as I said, it's 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 you know, it's just growing and growing in you know in its interest, but also its uh, uh, you know the, the the design characteristics of the product is uh, unlimited. And I think you know, with the young young architects and designers coming through. They are taking it to the next level, so I'm really excited about the product. I'm really excited about uh, you know the, the the future, and uh, that's it. So um, we've uh, we've got a number of questions here, so um, and we don't have a lot of time left, which uh, I didn't want to interrupt Chris because it's such an amazing amount of information he's providing. But I do actually commit to. Uh, um, answering some of these questions and sending them back out to the group today. Um, but, but a couple of quick questions just um, in the time we've got left. Um, one here about the use of timber in bushfire prone areas, particularly in the higher Bell 29 areas. Um, in those Bell 29 areas, can you use any other hardwood products other than bushfire resistant timbers? Uh, you can, but you have to have a fire retardant and a, a, you know, a, an approved fire retardant. Uh, applied to it, but generally uh, those bushfire resistant timbers will pass any um, any uh, building surveyors uh, requirements. But if you want to use anything else, uh, you have to use one of these approved fire, which is another another application, another cost, another process. Yep. So that, that's right. So Bell 29, you're pretty much restricted to bushfire resistant timbers yep. and then the, the lower Bell levels, you can use some different uh, density species. Yep. Correct. In terms yep. of decking, um, what uh, would be the recommendation? Sort of narrow boards or wider boards for decking? Uh, well, that, that, that's that's an interesting one too. It, it, it depends from performance or design. You know, there has been definitely a, um, a trend we've seen lately, you know, if you went back five years ago, everyone wanted wider boards, everyone wanted, you know, boardwalk type decking. We've seen more of a trend for narrower um, screen boards, but also decking just in design. From a performance, you know, if you look at, uh, you know, timber swelling and shrinking, you know, it's, it's a, basically it's a percentage of the cross section. So, you know, depending on the timber, you'll get somewhere between five and 8% uh, 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 swelling, you know, if it gets wet. So you can actually do the maths. Uh, you're on a 140 wide board. Uh, you're looking at uh, seven to eight mil uh, that they can swell. So you basically a wider board, you'll leave bigger gaps. A narrow board, you'll have smaller gaps. So it really comes down to design element. But but I would always, you know, my, my personal preference is, is narrow boards. But but like I said, you know, things become in trend and out of trend but at the moment I've, I've seen you know the trend probably in narrow boards there's a couple of questions here just around fixing of decking particularly with hardwood decks and hardwood joists and when you get a bit of expansion and contraction that uh, fixings can can um, snap um what would be your advice there and and sometimes a hidden fixings is that a sort of another way to go for decking uh yeah no there is in in fixing i, I think you know 
we we do always recommend stainless steel fixings, and um, you know uh, you know it is you know that it is a compromise between the more uh, the more subtle that, that the fixing you know the, the narrower the gauge, the more likely they are to snap, but also the more they disappear. So so it really you know it probably depends more on the on the width. Yeah, we would never recommend a narrow gauge fixing for fastener for a, uh, a boardwalk deck, a wide deck or a, a thick deck, you know, you'd need to, you know, they need to be fixed with, uh, you know, galvanized or stainless steel uh, bugle screws, you know, that are big and, and chunky. Uh, yeah, whereas, you know, a, a finer deck, you know, you, you definitely can uh, use a, a more narrow gauge and, um, uh, you know, um, the the screwless decks or the, the, the ones that, you know, are decking systems that, you know, clip, clip in from the sides, you know, they uh, they have their part as well, but, um, you know, it, it is another process and it is another cost as well. Yeah. But we have run out of time. It's been a fantastic presentation, Chris, sort of chock-a-block full of lots of fantastic information. So on behalf of everyone that attended, I really do thank you. Uh, there were a couple of questions about where can we go for additional information, um, in addition, obviously, to Radial's website on specific products. There's a number of technical design guides from the Wood Solutions website I'd certainly refer you to. Any of the information you need around durability, have a look at technical design guide number five and information around building in bushfire prone areas where there were certainly a number of questions. Have a look at technical design guide four. But when you're there, just have a look there with all the technical design guides. As I say, there's 50 of them there. So that there's a whole range that I'm sure you will find of interest. So um, just uh, in terms of next week's uh, uh, webinar at 11 o'clock, uh, really exciting to announce that the Wood Solutions Mid-Rise Advisory Team is going to do a bit of a joint presentation with the full team about some of the lessons they've learnt over the last four years with the program. So you, most of you have probably heard some of the team speaking over the webinar series so far, but a selection of them are going to really sort of provide some really interesting lessons that they've learned around mid-rise construction. So please tune in for that one. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, we'll finish up now, but um, it's been a great presentation. Thanks once again, Chris, and uh, we'll see you all again next week.